Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying the Judgment Seat of Christ, or Bema. This is part two. In part one, I talked about a few remarkable parallels concerning how that, uh, that Lucifer sinned and that, and, and that Adam sinned. Uh, we see that uh, heaven was without sin. Uh, Lucifer sinned. Uh, he's condemned. God restores fallen creation. And standing in between that is God creating man and woman, our first parents. And we see a remarkable parallel where that the world is again without sin. Mankind sins, just as uh, Lucifer sinned, and is condemned, and then God will restore fallen creation. I also pointed out what I thought was a very remarkable parallel in, in how that the Father worked through the Son, which really goes right to the heart of our discussion concerning the judgment for the believer. The Father worked through the Son as Christ lives His life in and through us today. It's no different. Christ lived in utter, complete dependence upon the Father, and that is what we do. Now you would think that, now, and I pointed this out in my last video, and I think this is worthy of note. Man uh, today, cr Christians, many Christians today, think that they, they can do or should do what Jesus him himself refused to do, which is uh, work on their own. Uh, of course, uh, we're talking about, in the strictest sense, we're talking about working in our own strength. And if I was to sum up the entire uh, study on the judgment seat of Christ, what it really boils down to, in my opinion, is something as simple as, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that the subject is, is simple by any means. In fact, uh, let me just pause right here and say that uh, I've determined that there must be a part three to this study in order for me to, to deal honestly with the text, particularly the grammar of the passage itself in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, before we're through discussing this issue. Uh, but believers today tend to think that they can do on their own when they have a sin nature. When we have a sin nature, God hasn't eradicated our sin nature. Now, it is true that we are fully righteous in Christ. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. God imputed that righteousness to us. And it's true that we have a sinless new, new nature. But the difference between us and Jesus Christ is that he was without sin. He had no sin nature. And yet he refused to do anything on his own. And believers today think that they somehow are able to and are supposed to to do what Christ himself refused to do even though he didn't have a sin nature. So you have the Father working in and through the sinless Son of God in which Christ is one with the Father. We are one with the Father. So his works are therefore the works of God the Father. And understand that uh, also, and we understand that, that, that the Father and the Son were the same God. They were one. If you've seen me, said our Lord, you've seen the Father. But in John chapter 17, in the high priestly prayer, Jesus' prayer was that we would be one with Him just as He was one with the Father. And so Christ does nothing on His own. He did nothing on His own, though He Himself was God of very God. And here we have a sinless new nature. It's almost as if, and I don't know how to phrase this exactly, but it's almost as if, The Lord God Almighty, the one who redeemed us, who died in our place, wanted us to, to start off, to begin our lives in Him, being as identified with Him, as closely identified with Him as we possibly could. 
So you have this guy, you know, he's one with Christ. Christ lives and works in and through his sinless new nature. His, his works are therefore the works of God. Yet he attempts to do what Jesus himself refused to do, even though he was God, a very God who had no sin, who knew no sin, who had no sinful nature as we do. And I don't want you to miss that point, folks, because I think it's, it, it's extremely relevant when it comes to the study or the na of the nature of our relationship as it pertains to the flesh versus the spirit, law versus grace. So we're going to go on from here and we're going to look at, uh, at a few other verses. This video may proceed a little bit slower than the last one because I think I've had just a little less coffee. So if you'll, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to go through a few verses and uh, that I think are relevant also to this subject. And then in part three, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the text with a magnifying glass. So not even the Son of God, our blessed Redeemer, glorified Himself, but was He was glorified by the Father. We understand that from John chapter 17. And yet self seeks, it tends to seek its own glory, when no glory has been nor ever will be given it. God will never glorify self. He'll never glorify the believer in Christ. Why? Because, look, He'll never glorify the, us as believers in Christ because of anything that we do or do not do, whatever the case may be. Why is that? Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called, and whom He called, them He also justified, and whom He justified, them he also glorified. It's already been done. It's already been done. So he's not going to glorify the flesh. He's not going to glorify self. There is nothing that you can do, nothing on your own that you can do that will make you even that will even make you more acceptable to God because we have been accepted in the Beloved. So that is a most remarkable parallel. But I want to, us to look at what I believe is probably the single most remarkable parallel ever. And I'm not trying to minimize any of the other parallels or, or types or shadows, but the parallel, folks, of His death and resurrection to life which is a commonly known fact among just about every Christian uh, that alive today. Oh, Steve, I know that he died. I know that he was raised from the dead. I understand his death and resurrection. But do you understand how that that actually mirrors our death and resurrection to life? Not just in the future, not just in the future, but now. He died. We know that Jesus Christ died on a cross. We know that we're going to die someday, if, unless, unless we're alive when the rapture occurs, which I think we will be. And we will be raised, just as He was raised. We'll be raised from the dead. Whether we're alive uh, or dead will make a difference. If we've died, we'll be raised from the dead. If, if, we're, if we haven't died, those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the Lord. I'm talking about the parallel, the mirror, the, I, I actually think I, identification is a better word because that's exactly how Scripture presents that reality. Now, folks, we don't have any recollection we don't have any memory, any recollection at, uh, at all whatsoever of our having been crucified with Christ, but, we ha but, but God says we have been. Now you can look at that as, as well, give, we're giving God some poetic license here, and He's talking you know, somewhat in poetic terms. We didn't really, we weren't really crucified with Christ. We weren't really buried and raised with Him. You know, that's just uh, poetry. 
And folks, I don't, I don't understand it that way. I don't see it that way. I believe that when he died, he took us down into death with him. He's always known you, you folks, you who believe in Christ, we who believe in Christ, he's always known us and he's known us by name. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. When he died, he died in your place. It was very personal. It was very intimate. It was not, well, I'm dying for those who will believe in me and I don't know who they are. He took you before you were ever born from your mother's womb, before you were you, your parents ever, ever gave a thought to your existence. He took you as he did every single believer Every, every seed that he planted, every, every believer that he planted, every one of his sheep, he took them down into death with him. When, when he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried with him. And when he rose from the dead, we rose with him. And that mirrors his death and resurrection. If you, if you want to turn to Philippians 3, 10, and 11, we hear Paul saying, who already knew the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not uh, him speaking prior to his, his conversion on the road to Damascus. He says that I may know him. You know, well, uh, Paul, I thought you already knew him. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by many if by any means i might attain unto the out resurrection the word is out resurrection in the greek of the dead he's he's speaking of a resurrection that is distinctly different separate from his resurrection from the dead physically Romans 6, 5 goes on to explain this even further. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, many believers will read that and they will think that, well, it's just speaking again of our being raised uh, with Christ someday, whenever that might be. And I don't believe that that text is talking about that at all. If we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, and that is a first-class condition, since we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. The life that we live now is resurrection life. We can live on, on one side of the cross or the other. Romans 6, 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, Again, that's a first-class condition. Since we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Now, you have to make up your mind whether that's talking about future or, or present. I believe it's talking about the present. It, perhaps it's talking about both. But I believe that the context is our present, ongoing walk and relationship with Him now I mean, it's a wonderful thing to read God talking about our future resurrection from the dead. But I almost, I'm, all, I'm almost willing to say that, that God considers that sort of a given, you know, as if we, we, should, we should have already come to understand that. And if you look at the context, folks, these are passages that deal with the nature of our walk and the difference between law and grace. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So there we see the, the unity in the spirit. This was the same unity that, that the, our Lord expressed that he had with the Father, or that the Father was working through him. And we know that we walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 1 9, but we had the sentence of death, Paul says, in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves. Well, if we stop right there, 
I think that we can see that what Paul is talking about when he mentions the sentence of death in ourselves is not so he's not re referring to something that relates to martyrdom, to physical death, but the sentence of death in ourselves. In other words, we have been crucified with Christ because he gives a pur he, he puts a, a purpose clause in there that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. Second Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency of, is of God. And it's hard, folks, for me not to compare that with Christ himself saying that I of myself do nothing. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We know that that's Christ, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, not of us, which would be law. 2 Corinthians 4.10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the, of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Well, is the Lord Jesus dying over and over again in us? No, he's not. But we're carrying about in the body his death, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. We, we have to understand our identification with him and his death, folks, is what takes in, it is the sword, as you might say, that slays any, any excellency of the power as, 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 as coming from ourselves. That the power may be of God and not, not of, of self. Self, the flesh, the law. 2 Corinthians 4.11, For we which live are always delivered unto death. We're always delivered, constantly delivered over unto death for Jesus' sake. Why? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Folks, I could spend probably a month on that one verse. You know, we read these verses and, and I think that we and I have to include myself in this, we will read a verse of Scripture and we will look at that as, I think, too simplistic, far much too simplistically, most of the time. We don't, we don't take and, and absorb uh, the, the full impact or consider the full impact of the words that God has used in writing that verse that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Now, folks, if there's anything that says it's not of us, but it's him, it's that verse. And the verse is saying so much. It's saying that we do live and that by living, we are delivered unto death for his sake. What is that? What, what, de what death is he talking about? He's talking about death to self, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, so that he lives his life in and through us as opposed to our living our own lives in our own strength, walking according to the flesh, walking according to law. 2 Corinthians 12.10 clearly says, For when I am weak, then I am strong. And, and most believers that I meet nowadays believe that it's all about us being strong. There is no doubt in my mind that weakness leads to dependence upon God. It's when we come to the end of ourselves and we realize that there is nothing of ourselves that compares to Christ living his life in and through us and that by faith and, and we know from Paul's teaching that it is the righteousness of God that is based on faith and that whatsoever is not of faith is sin Galatians 2:20 drives goes right to the point of the whole matter I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I 
but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We can't say that we're not crucified with Christ or we can't ignore the, the, the fact or the reality that we have been crucified with Christ and say that we live. You know, uh, to avoid the yet not I in that verse, I live yet not I, well, yeah, but I really do. It's really me. You know, I change the text, change the words to say, instead of it saying, but Christ liveth in me, well, I live in Christ. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of, not faith in, the faithfulness of God, the faith of God, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 6.13, For the circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. If you've been kicked out of a church or have left a church because of law teaching, because you didn't find joy and peace and comfort in that teaching, and they couldn't understand why you left, the text is clear. They don't keep the law themselves, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Galatians 6.14 but, but as for me, may I never boast. May I never boast. If you just took those words right there, folks, may I never boast, and you took those at face value, those are just four words, may I never boast. Does it say may I not often boast may I never boast except in such and such thing you know there are a few exceptions I can I can boast here but I can't boast there may I never boast just those four words have are carry such heavy weight may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it doesn't just stop right there. You don't have a period there. You have a comma. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And I've pointed out in the past how I believe that most of the time the way that the Lord uses, the Holy Spirit uses world it's in the context of the world religious system. Galatians 6.17 From now on let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I was uh, in a discussion with another believer through email uh, concerning chastening. Uh, and I, I was trying to point out to this dear brother, that chastening had no relationship to sin whatsoever. If the text is clear in Hebrews, we're chastened for one reason, and that is because we are sons, and it's because you are a son that you are chastened. He chastens every son whom he receives. That's without all without exception. has no relationship to sin. It is child training. Child training. And it has a purpose. Paul says, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Philippians 1.21, for, for to me to live is Christ. Can't get any more clear than that. that. That pretty much drives an arrow straight through the heart of the issue. For me to live is Christ. Text doesn't say for to me to live is to be try to be like Christ. Doesn't say that uh, for 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 me to live is to uh, try to uh, do my best to live as Christ lived. It says for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Galatians 
To die is gain. Well, you can, you folks out there, you can read that as heaven. Well, what he's talking about, to die is gain. Yeah, because you go to heaven, and man, heaven's a really wonderful place, and it sure, it sure beats this place, especially right now. I don't see that. I don't think that's what the text is talking about at all. I think it's talking about Galatians 2.20, that we've been crucified with him. To die is to gain. Crucified, self, we, we die to sin. Self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. Six things, according to Scripture, that we've died to. Of course it's, it's gain. Of course it's gain to take and, and look at our, our identification with Him, which is, is so intimately presented, so precisely presented in Scripture. It makes it absolutely clear that God has nothing to do with the flesh, that He put the flesh to death. God has nothing to do with the old man. You know, so many of you Christians out there are so worried about your old man, the flesh, your sin, and all the rotten things that you've ever done, and, and even the things that you're still doing. And your focus is all on sin, not the Savior. You have died to sin. The sin issue has been forever settled. Now, it does make a difference how you live. But how would you rather live? Would, I mean, are you going to go about your day, your day-to-day -day routine, uh, in such a way as to where that your focus is so much on your sin that you're trying to use the flesh, which God has nothing to do with, to try to overcome that sin? And, and consider that to be gain. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 3.3 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. You've seen me slide that onto the screen uh, you know, a number of times. It's one of my favorite verses. It goes right to the heart of the issue. We have no confidence in the flesh. And yet most of modern Christianity today is encouraging you, enticing you, preaching to you, trying to teach you to have confidence in the flesh. Now, they may not come right out and, and, and say that exactly and, and, and phrase it that way and put it in, in those exact terms, but that is what they're doing when they preach law, not grace. Philippians 3, 4, and 6, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, says Paul. Have you compared yourself to Paul? Colossians 1, 29, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. I also labor. See, you're not, you're not, you're not idle. You labor, but you strive according to His working, not your own, His working, which works in you mightily. Colossians 1.29 Of course, we know from John chapter 15, the whole passage concerning Christ the vine, we are the branches. Any of you out there who've ever planted anything, planted a tree, it, it, in fact, I'll even go as far as to say if you've just looked at a tree, you know or you should know that it the branches don't produce the fruit the vine does and then there's the marvelous passage in john chapter 12 verily uh, verily i say unto you except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it, it abides alone but if it dies it brings forth much fruit and we know that he was referring to himself we know our Lord was referring to His death. The corn of wheat falling into the ground, dying. If it hadn't, if He had not, He would ab abide alone. But because He died, He brought forth much fruit. That's you and me. Every believer, everyone who would all of God's children. He was referring to Himself. In 2 
2 Corinthians 4.12, so then death works in us, but life in you. Can you see the, the comparison there? Paul is, is referring to the believer in Christ, so when you compare those two verses, you ought to see how our death and resurrection with Christ mirrors His death and resurrection. You know, I've often told believers that just as important a fact as it is that to understand that His death for us in our place, how, in, how indispensable that is as it regards our justification, our being made righteous. The fact that we died with Him, which is something that you seldom even hear taught today, which is, astounds me given the fact that of the number of times it's mentioned in Scripture, and I've just read a few verses. These are just a few. There are a lot more. But you hardly ever hear the subject even discussed in Christian circles. And yet it goes right to the heart of how we are to live and walk in our relationship with Christ under grace. Why, you know, I don't, why is that? I think it's, it's simply because most of modern teaching, Christian pulpit teaching today, Bible uh, study group gatherings, uh, just standing on the street corner, for the most part, it's just all law-centered, self-centered, flesh-centered. It has no room. It has no place for the truths concerning our identification with Christ in His death and, and burial and resurrection. But I can tell you that when we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and the judgment seat of Christ, which will occur immediately after the rapture, it has great importance great relevance to that subject. Now, it might be more proper to call it something far greater than just a mirror or, or, a, or a parallel. It is closer to Him than that. We were identified with Him in His. We were identified with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection. Just how close are we to Christ, folks? Just how close... Are you to Christ? You may think that you're, well, Steve, I don't know about me. I, maybe you're pretty close to him. Uh, uh, and then some of you might say, well, I'm, I'm not even so sure about that, about when it comes to Steve, because he seems kind of far off base on everything. But I, I don't know about you, but, but me, you might be close to him, but I'm, not just, I'm just not that close to him. What would cause you to say that? The only thing that would cause you folks to say that would be a lack of understanding, that's all. We know Jesus was loved by the Father. Well, so are you. We know that He is fully righteous, as are we. He was crucified, buried, raised from the dead. Well, so were we. Oh, Steve, but I don't think I was. Yes, you were. He says you were. He's now seated in heaven, as are we, because we are co-seated with Him in the heavenlies. And folks, I don't think you can get any closer to God than that. Oh, Steve, I can't be co-seated with him in the heavenlies. You might be co-seated with him in the heavenlies, but surely I'm not co-seated with him. In the... Yes, you are. You are co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies, or you're not in Christ. He walked in complete dependence upon the Father. We're to do the same. Why should that surprise anybody? That would, be, that, that would be my question. Why would that surprise anyone, any Christian? I thought, I thought it was all about us, us looking at his life and, and wanting to live as he lived. Oh, but Steve, I'm doing that, man. I'm trying my best. No, that's law. Why do you... It amazes me. Here we have the sinless Son of God. Could, could not sin. 
and yet he deliberately chose. He, in fact, he refused to live and operate of it in and of himself. The lesson, folks, there is for us. He walked in complete dependence upon the Father. We are to do the same. He did nothing of himself. The same is said of the believer. The flesh profits nothing. It profits nothing. Paul said that he considered it all loss. Rubbish to gain Christ. He only gave eternal life to those whom the Father gave Him. Okay? Well, the gospel we preach is received only by those who have ears to hear. Are you telling me there's not identities here that, that we can see, folks? The gospel we preach is, is received only by those who have ears to hear. He glorified the Father on the earth as we also glorify both the Father and the Son. He and the Father were one. We are one with them. He said that they might have my joy fulfilled in, the, in themselves. My peace I give unto you. That's not your joy, your peace. That's His joy. His peace. You can have a false joy and a false peace. What He's given you is He's given you His joy and His peace. Oh, Steve, I don't, I don't, I don't, no, no, not me. Do you honestly think that, folks, that anything in that entire chapter, that high priestly prayer of John 17, anything that, the, that Jesus prayed, if he did not receive that, well, um, let me just tell you, if, we, if he did not receive everything that he asked for from the Father in John 17, we have an enormous problem, theological problem, a theological problem of, of monumental proportions. If he prayed for anything that he didn't receive, of course you, you, he gave you his peace. Of course he gave you his joy. They are not of the world, he said, even as I am not of the world is what he prayed. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. It's just one identif identity after another. Identified with Christ. We have been identified with Christ in His death, burial, resurrection. In fact, I'll even go as far as to say His ascension. When He ascended back to heaven, we ascended with Him. We were in Christ. We are now co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. You can't get any closer than that. It saddens me that so many Christians don't realize just what Christ did on their behalf. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. That's what he prayed. He sympathizes with our weaknesses, was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Without sin. And we have a sinless new man which cannot sin. We who have entered his rest have rested from our works as God did from his. There's another identity. If the world hate us, we know that it hated him before it hated us. There's another identity. These are not things that we have to make happen, folks. These are things that are true. When they saw him, they saw the Father. If you see me, I want you to see him, not me. How does or, or how did this all come about. Well, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. Die. This, this principle of nature is true in the spiritual sense 
and it's reflected in the process of new birth itself. Christ didn't plant tear, he planted only wheat. He said concerning the tear, an enemy hath done this. You know, if we plant squash, you know, we don't we don't get tomatoes. The seed that we plant brings forth fruit of its own kind, and his death brought us forth. His death brought us forth. No wonder Paul says, Death works in us, but life in you. I don't have any problem, folks, saying that death works in me and life in you. That's what Paul said. The same was true of our Lord. His death brought us forth. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. This is the meaning of John 12, 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal, guard it unto life eternal. And then he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Well, our lives, our message, our ministry today receives pretty much the exact same identical reaction, the same opposition. And, and it's not only that it's just as unwelcome, what intrigues me is who it is that it's opposing. Who is it that's opposing the message that we preach? Well, it's, it's, here's another identity for you folks. It was the religious system of his time a religious system based on human merit, law. In fact, it was that system, folks, that had our Lord crucified. And you want to live under law? Romans 8, 36, As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And I wouldn't let that depress you, folks. In fact, I'll even go as far as to say happy funeral. Happy funeral. Yeah, you have died to sin, self, law, the world, Satan, and death. And, and I hope that it, and, and I, I know that's, that's true on, on God's end, but it, practically speaking, in your own experience, in your own life, if you haven't come to understand the meaning of that and the purpose of that, if you haven't, in, in an experiential, uh, physical way, spiritual way, in your present body, the body that you walk around in, if you haven't come to understand your the the reality or come to experience the reality of that death. I hope you do. That's what I mean by happy funeral. Because there's life on the other side. And I'm not talking about future. I'm talking about when I say life on the other side, life on the other side of the cross in the sense that we've been raised with Christ to walk in newness of life now, right now. We are experience, We are strange creatures, folks. We are, we are experiencing death on the one hand, death to self, yet life abundant in the new man on the resurrection side of the cross. And the both simultaneous right here, right now. Someday, the physical will, will join in with this. I mean, it, it will become, someday we will come to see that the, the whole issue of the our, you know, when our bodies are, are, are transformed, when that metamorphosis takes place and we step out of the, the, the time, the temporal, into eternity, someday all of that reality will become solidified, concreted in the spiritual eternal sense. But right now we're going through that as we journey through time. And there is joy in suffering, folks. There's a reason why man was created from the dust. You know, flesh is considered earthy. The word spirit or the word spiritual 
you know, in the Greek is the word pneumos. It's from which we get the word pneumatic. Like, you know, I have a pneumatic drill, you know. There's a reason why water and food are necessary for nourishment, life. All of these things reflect the spiritual. That's because that which is natural or earthy reflects the spiritual, the heavenly. He planted us. I mean, I, I've, I've talked a lot about, I think in the past, about, I've mentioned it on, on occasion, I've mentioned it numerous times about how that you plant a seed in the, in the ground, that seed is, you tear open that pack of seeds, that, that, you look at those seeds, they're not dead, they're alive, they're living. And it's when you put them in the ground that they die. You put them in the cold, dark, damp earth and that, that may seem like a horrible place to be and in, in fact, in all reality it is, but, but it's, it's through that death, that, the death of that seed that it brings forth fruit of its own kind. It's amazing how the, the natural life parallels the spiritual. You know, how a covenant is a sign. Or, uh, I mean, or a rainbow is a sign or a covenant from God. How, how that a stairway represents the bridge between earth and heaven. How the gray hair, you know, is symbolic of wisdom, of life experience gained over time. And uh, sometimes I wonder about that one, you know. that a rock denotes strength and permanence. I was reminded of that when I had to, to lift and move a heavy rock out in the pasture. You know, as opposed to the temporary nature of sand, you know, how that a dove portrays innocence and purity and represents the Holy Spirit, how that the sacrificial lamb is a symbol that can never be ignored or, or understated God reveals himself in so many wonderful ways that can be seen every day in the world around us, in the skies and in the heavens above our heads, in numbers, in types, figures, shadows, of an extent that's just far too great to mention here. So it shouldn't surprise us to see our life so intimately related to our Lord in so many ways and it ought to thrill us to death, pardon the pun, when we see just how our death to sin self and the law was only possible because he identified with us, us with him, he identified us with him in his death, burial and resurrection to rise from the dead as he did to walk in newness of life. What life? Our own? No, his life. We were not a spectator, folks, of his crucifixion. We don't stand in the, in the present year of 2020 looking back at the cross as a spectator. We died with him and he didn't leave us in the tomb. When he raised from the dead, we raised with him and we are even now co-seated with him in the heavenlies. And yet man looks around himself and asks, where is God? Where's God? I've known many believers to even ask that question. Where's God? So how does all this relate to the judgment seat of Christ? Well, I believe it does, and uh, we'll be talking about that in part three. Uh, so uh, for those of you who uh, missed uh, part one, you might want to go back and and review that before uh, part three. Yeah, I've got some sad breaking news for you folks. Uh, there's gonna have to be a part three because it's just too overwhelming a topic for me to, to not deal with, especially when we haven't even really gotten to the heart of the text yet. Just know that an understanding of our identification with him in his death, burial, and resurrection is, is crucial when it comes to understanding what occurs 
at the judgment seat of Christ because it was on that cross that we died to sin, self, and the law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. Look, I love you all, I truly do. I want to thank all of you for your continued support of this channel. You know who you are. I want to thank you for your continued prayers for this ministry. We so desperately rely on that. We need your prayers. I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate all your messages of encouragement, of comfort. Until next time, this is Steve. Thank you for watching.